Today we're going to take a look at an approximation algorithm, or more specifically an approximation scheme for the knapsack problem. So what is the knapsack problem? So imagine you are a hobbit, you are standing in front of the dragon's horde, you want to take as much treasure as possible, but you only have your little knapsack here. So there are n items, n objects to choose from. Each of them has a certain size and gives you a certain profit. And your knapsack only has a certain capacity. So your task is now to maximize your profit by selecting items whose total size, so if you sum up these numbers of the items that you pack, the total size should not exceed your capacity. So in our example here, what would be the optimal choice? The optimal choice here is those items now here in green. They give us a profit of 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 10 of 16. And they fit into our knapsack because 1 plus 1 plus 2 plus 4 is 8, so less than 50. And this is optimal because any solution that potentially would be better would have to include this one. But that one already takes up 12 of our 15 liters, so we would not be able to pack this very valuable item down here. The knapsack problem is NP hard, and this can be seen by reduction from the subset sum problem. There is a simple true approximation, but this algorithm I'm not planning to talk about, but let me at least briefly mention it. So the idea is that you always pick the item with the largest profit to size ratio until your knapsack is full. So this would mean taking this one first, because it has a profit to size ratio of 10 to 4, and this is larger than any of the other numbers here. And then the next item would be the one of these here, two to one, two to one. We can still pack something, so we do two to two, because four to 12 is worse. And then we would not be able to pack this one. So in this case, this greedy solution would actually already be the optimal solution. In general, it is actually not an approximation, so we have to be slightly careful, but as I said, this is not what I want to talk about today. So what you need to do here is that you either take those that you get by the greedy choice, or just one item, namely the one that, you, the first item that in this algorithm you couldn't pack because you hit the capacity. So in this case, it would simply be the last one here. Alternative, you could say you simply take the most valuable item, assuming always that you only have items here anyway that you can actually pack. And in this way, you can get it to approximation. Before we further talk about approximation algorithms, we first switch topics and look at a bit of complexity theory. And uh, first of all, we're going to look at pseudo polynomial time algorithms. So let's assume we have an optimization problem where the input consists of objects, objects we have here, and numbers. So in our case, with the costs and the profits are all numbers. So if we have an input like that, then when we talk about input size, we also have to think about how these numbers are encoded. And typically we assume that these are encoded in binary. So the input size is the size that we get if we encode the numbers in binary, which for instance means that if there's a 5 somewhere, then this would in binary look like that. So it contributes 3 to the input size. Yeah, so the logarithm essentially of this number. So contrast this to the unary size or size of the input when we encode in unary. So there, yeah, 
So there we encode numbers in unary. What that means is essentially that a five consists of one, 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 one. So essentially a number contributes simply itself to the input size. Now uh, we call an algorithm a polynomial time algorithm if it is polynomial in the input size as in encoded in binary. And now in contrast, a pseudo polynomial time algorithm is one that is polynomial in the input size when encoded in unary. So this is a much weaker concept because uh, uh, this the unary encoding can result in something that is exponential uh, in what you would get if you have a binary encoding. Yeah, so here you get the logarithm of five. Um, here you simply get five itself. So this is exponential in this number three. So in particular, if you have a pseudo polynomial time algorithm, it is not necessarily a polynomial time algorithm. So now we've talked about algorithms. There are corresponding concepts in terms of hardness, namely the following. So an optimization problem is called strongly NP-hard if it remains NP-hard even if we encode the instance in unary. And an optimization problem is weakly NP-hard if it is NP-hard under binary encoding, but not necessarily under unary encoding. What that in particular means, a weakly NP-hard problem is not necessarily strongly NP-hard, and a weakly NP-hard problem could actually have a pseudo-polynomial time algorithm, while a strongly NP-hard problem cannot. Yeah, so if a strongly NP-hard problem would have a pseudo-polynomial time algorithm, then we could show that P equals NP. Now, examples for strongly NP-hard problems um, and are not necessarily optimization problems. So all of these are actually decision problems that I'm listing here. Uh, satisfiability, Hamiltonian circuit, three partition bin packing. Examples for weakly np hard problems, but which are not strongly np hard. There is a partition problem, so not three partition, but simply partition, upside sum, and the knapsack problem that we're looking at today. So next we're going to take a look at a pseudo polynomial time algorithm for the knapsack problem. So for that, we are going to look at the largest, the maximum profit that occurs among all elements. Keep in mind, pseudo polynomial time means that it is sufficient to be polynomial in terms of the numbers that occur. So it is fine if my algorithm at the end is polynomial, let's say in n, so the number of objects and in this p, because p is one of the numbers that actually occurs. And we were going to make use of this in designing a dynamic programming algorithm. So you're going to make use of P. P in this case is 10, but the largest profit that occurs. And the first observation that we can make is that the optimum solution for an upset problem, we can bound it now from above and below. From below, we can bound it by P because this is a packing this object is a valid choice. So we assume that we only have objects that we could actually pack. So P is a lower bound here. And on the other hand, um, as an upper bound, since we only have N objects and the maximum profit is P, we get N times P. And of course we could get a tighter upper bound here by taking the sum of all of the profits, but N times P is simply a nice short expression. So now we are on our way of designing a dynamic program. And for that, we first introduce the following subsets. So we're going to prioritize this by I and P, where I tells me that I'm going to look at the first I elements only. Yeah, in this case, so I assume we have A1, A2, and then AI minus one, this is AI. In my example, this is AI. Uh, in particular, this one is um, N is larger than I. So that element I would ignore. So I'm only looking at those ele elements up to 
index i and I'm asking for a subset, so this SI4 would be a subset where the profit is exactly 4, so exactly this P here. And among these subsets, I want to have that one with minimum total size. So this example, this would be these two elements because their total size is 2. While if to get profit four, alternatively, I could have simply only taken this one, but that would have had size 12, so larger. I could have also took, taken a combination of this and that one, um, but that would have had size three. So those two elements are the ones that determine SI4. Of course, depending on the profit, such a set might not exist. So for instance, SI5 simply does not exist because those profits cannot add up to 5. Now in the dynamic program, we're now going to look at the size of these sets SIP and we were going to call them AIP. So AIP is a total size of SIP. And if um, the set SIP does not exist, we're going to set this number to infinity. Now in our example, AI4, what value does it have? So this should be the total size of SI4. SI4 we already determined, and its size is one plus one is two. Now, let's assume we could compute all of those AIPs, or let's assume we already have computed them, then we can easily compute opt simply because we then also have computed a and p for all values of p and then i will just have to look for the largest p where a and p still is below budget yeah, so that's an opt i have computed all of the aips i'm taking the a and p with max profit and below or at most size capacity so now let's actually compute those AIPs. So A1P, I can compute easily. Uh, keep in mind, A10, so zero profit, I can actually achieve by simply taking none of the elements and the size, the corresponding size is zero. So A10, actually AI0 is always zero. And then otherwise A1P, is infinity except for so we're only looking at the first element so except for the profit of the first element there i get simply the size of that element so now we want to compute a2p a3p and so on um, before we do so let's take a convention that aip for p smaller than zero that that is simply infinity so now we can formulate the recurrence for aip so a i plus one p so now we want to, we already computed how to pack or which uh, elements we should select for profits if we only have the first i elements. And now we get the I, additionally the i plus first element. So what is a i plus one p? So for any value of p, we have two choices. Either the new element is included in the set si plus 1p or not if it is not included then i simply take get the same value as without that element or object i mean so then i get aip or i include the last element so then i will get its size and with that already also get its profit and then I somehow still get to need to get the remaining profit, which I get by looking at P, so the profit that I want to achieve, minus the profit that the A I plus one gives me. So that's the profit that I should be getting from the remaining elements. And this is the recurrence for A I P. So what time does it take to compute these values?
if you look at the recurrence, this can be computed per AIP in constant time. So we just have to think about how many values do we compute. So the number of values that we compute. So we're going through for i from 1 to n, so that, that is n, and then times for p we go from 0 to n times p, so that is n here times n times p, so overall this takes n squared times p time. So we can compute the optimum in O of n squared times p time, and this is now pseudo polynomial. So the knapsack problem can be solved in pseudo polynomial time, specifically in O of n squared times p time. So in particular, we can conclude that the knapsack problem is not strongly NP hard, um, uh, but it is weakly NP hard. So let's try to compute those values AIP in my example here. So here you have a table to fill in. Maybe pause the video and do this for yourself, also using the recurrence from the previous slide. So let me go through a couple of these values. So A1P we can easily do. So I said A0, A10, so zero profit I get by taking no element and that has cost, uh, has size zero. And now with the first element, the only profit that I can achieve is four. So except for four, everything is infinity here. And for four, I get the size of the first element that is 12. And um, then this continues with infinity. Now, if I also include the second element, then I have the option. So first of all, with zero, I can again get with zero. And the uh, profit of two, I now can get with one. Profit of one, I still cannot achieve. Now four, I can still just achieve with a one, so I get a 12. Um, but now I can also get six, namely by taking both elements, uh, both objects, and then the size is 13. and so on. And if you now also include the third element, so 0 plus 2 is here, that position, and there I get a 1, but the 1, I then I take the minimum of that and what we have there already, so this stays the same. In principle, I look backwards from here, but I can also look forwards from here and where I have the table. So the 1 here plus this one here gives me a 2 here, infinity here, 12 plus 1 is still 13, but now I also have here 13 plus 1 is 14 here and so on. And in this way I can fill all of my table. This is what you should get if you do it. And then I simply look at the largest profit. So here I have a larger profit but the size is 18 so that won't work. Here the size is 8 so that's fine. So the profit that I can achieve is 16 as we already knew. Yeah, so we have that this problem can be solved in pseudopolynomial time in n squared times p. Now this obviously is not a polynomial time algorithm because we have this p here. But if p would be polynomial in n, then this would be polynomial time. Why do I say this? Because we're going to use this pseudopolynomial time algorithm as a basis to get an approximation algorithm or an approximation scheme. And we do, will do this in a way where we select P depending on N and the approximation factor that we want to achieve. But overall what we will get will be, in some sense at least, polynomial. In some sense, so for that I have to introduce the notion of approximation schemes. So we have an optimization problem, the knapsack problem, and now we say that an algorithm is a polynomial time approximation scheme, or for short, PTAS, for the problem, 
if for every instance, and the instance consists now simply of an instance to the problem, and an epsilon value, so for an instance together with an epsilon, the algorithm should give a solution with a property that it is at most 1 plus epsilon larger than the optimum, assuming that we have a minimization problem, or in our case we have a maximization problem, we want to maximize the profit, the objective value that the algorithm gives us should be at least 1 minus epsilon times opt. And the algorithm should have a polynomial running time if epsilon is fixed. Yeah, so for every fixed epsilon, so if epsilon is a constant, the running time should be polynomial. And if we strengthen this to the following, namely we do not require epsilon to be fixed, but we say the algorithm is polynomial in the input size and 1 divided by epsilon, then this is a fully polynomial time approximation scheme, or also for short, f -peters. So let's take a look at some examples. So if you have O of n to the 1 divided by epsilon, this is now uh, Peters, and is it also an f -peters? So this is only a Peters. So it is a Peters because if epsilon is a constant, the exponent is a constant, n to the constant is a polynomial in n, so it's a Peters. But it is not an f peters because this is not polynomial in 1 divided by epsilon. It is exponential in 1 divided by epsilon. Yeah, but it is a peters. The next uh, here expression here is indeed an f peters because it's polynomial in n, n to the 3, and in 1 divided by epsilon. I mean, it's 1 divided by epsilon squared, and then, then times n to the 3. And the last expression here obviously is not an f peters, but it is a peters. So it is not an f peters because it's exponential in 1 divided by epsilon. Next, we're going to design a fully polynomial time approximation t scheme for the knapsack problem. And for that, we're going to use our pseudo polynomial time algorithm in the following way. So as the idea is to, to scale the profits. So we call that the running time of a pseudo polynomial time algorithm was O of n squared times p. The problem being the p here, so the p makes it pseudo polynomial time. Now, if we scale down p, then we are going to improve this running time. So we have our instance, we have the epsilon that we want to achieve, and now this is our scaling factor, or the term by which we're going to divide our profits, and that is epsilon times p divided by n. We're going to define new profits, and those will be the old profits, divided by this value k. So why do we have this k? So I mean we're going to take this value here and this is at most p. We're going to for 1 divided by p and then there we get something between 0 and 1. That is already small but for us too small because it will always round to 0. Um, so then we're going to use this epsilon. I mean, we're going to divide by epsilon to spell that out again. And this will already nearly work, but the problem is that the rounding error that we make per element now is of order epsilon. But then if we take several elements, then this error adds up and it would, could add up to something of order epsilon times n, and to prevent that we also need the n here. Yeah, so this is our scaling term, and then we are going to look at these profits. And the idea of the algorithm now is simply to compute a solution for the new set of profits. So this now can be done, as we will see, um, in polynomial time, in terms of n and 1 divided by epsilon. And the solution to this is simply the solution that we then return for our original problem. So we have to show that the optimal solution for this modified profit is also a good uh, solution for the original profit. 
and that is captured by the following lemma. So the profit on the optimal solution for the modified profit is at least one minus epsilon times the optimal solution. So for this, we are going to look at an optimal solution. And now we're going to look at what happens with this optimal solution if we take the modified profit of it and then multiply it by k. So what we're doing here, the modified profit divides things by k and then we multiply it by k again. So we essentially get back to the new old value. But because we round it down in between, we might have a rounding error. So definitely if I divide by k, uh, um, round down and multiply by k again, I stay below the original value. So this is smaller equal the original profit of that element oi. So by rounding down, this number might be off by one. And then multiplying it by k, I might be off by k, but also not by more. So as a lower bound, I get the profit, the original profit of that element minus k. Now this was for one element. So let's have a look at what this means if I take all of the elements all of the objects in the optimal solution. So I sum up over these. Now I have the sum of these values. This is of course, then the, if I take this lower bound here, the sum of the optimal profits, which is simply the opt minus K times the number of elements in the sum. So minus L times K. I can lower bound this by making this number, the L larger, L is bounded by n, so I get opt minus n times k. And n times k, if you now look at k and multiply it by n, the n's cancel, epsilon times p remains. So this is now opt minus epsilon times p as a lower bound for this sum here. Here I have the sum of the modified profit of the object in the optimal solution. I can obviously get a better profit if instead of these objects, I take the optimal solution for the modified problem because we're here looking at the modified profit. So this sum can be bounded by the modified profit of the optimal solution for the modified profit. And I keep this factor K. And here now I have k times modified profit of something. So this times k, I can simply estimate or bound from above by the profit of whatever is here. So I now have here the number that I'm interested in, the profit that my algorithm gives. And I want to show that this is at least this one minus epsilon times opt. I have that is at least this number here, which in particular here I have again. And there I had opt minus epsilon times p as a lower bound. But now I can use that up opt as an upper bound for p. So I have now here opt minus epsilon times opt. This is exactly the expression that I wanted to have. So I can conclude that knapsack has an f peters and the running time of this f peters is O of n squared times the profit that I used here and the profits that I used here were the original profits divided by k. So they are here I have a one divided by epsilon term and a one divided by one divided by n term. So this gives me an extra factor of n here. And that is the running time of this f betas. With this, we're already done with the algorithmic part of the video. I just want to say some final words about the existence of an f betas versus a problem being strongly NP hard. And for that, first consider the following theorem. So imagine we have this optimization problem, an NP-hard minimization problem, let's say, where the objective function only takes integer values, and I have an upper bound on the optimum. And this upper bound is a polynomial in the input size encoded in unary. So let's assume we have an f task for this problem. Then we can observe that there is also a pseudo polynomial time algorithm for this problem. 
So for knapsack, what we did, we had a pseudo polynomial time algorithm and derived an F petas from that. Here, the theorem is about the other direction and it is very easy to prove. Um, so let's say we have an F petas. That means we have an algorithm that has a running time in the input size, so now in binary and one divided by epsilon. And now we do just take epsilon very small and very small so we can make use of the fact that the optimum is also bounded and we are going to take this bound in our epsilon so epsilon will be one divided by the upper bound for the optimum what this means is that if i now have a one plus epsilon approximation so our approximation scheme our fully polynomial time approximation scheme will give us a solution within opt um, times 1 plus epsilon. But now epsilon is so small yeah, that this is bounded by opt plus epsilon times opt, but opt is smaller than p times the unary encoding size. So if this is smaller than opt times epsilon times this. And since we picked epsilon, as one divided by that. This is now opt plus one, but what we say here is that our algorithm gives me a solution which is actually smaller than opt plus one. So, but the only option that it can have if it's smaller than opt plus one is that the algorithm gives me a solution that is actually the optimum. Yeah, so we can compute the optimum in pseudo polynomial time. So why pseudo polynomial time? Let's look at the running time. The running time of this algorithm is the running time of our f petas. And now we have to plug in the epsilon here. The epsilon is the p of the unary encoding. And that is a pseudo polynomial time algorithm because it's now polynomial. So we are applying a polynomial to polynomial. That's a polynomial here. So this is interesting for itself. But it is also interesting for the following reason. So a strongly NP-hard problem does not have a pseudo polynomial time algorithm. And we've now seen that having an F Peters and this additional condition here implies that you have a pseudo polynomial time algorithm. So in particular, this means that if we have a problem with this restriction here, and it is a strongly NP-hard problem, then I can conclude from those two theorems that it cannot have an F Peters. Yeah, so the existence of an F Peters implies that you cannot be strongly NP-hard. On the other hand, if you are strongly NP-hard, you will not have an F Peters. So today we have seen not simply an approximation algorithm, so in other videos so far we have seen always constant factor approximations and here also a greedy approach would have given us a constant factor approximation but we have seen the concept of a polynomial time approximation scheme peters in particular for the knapsack problem a fully polynomial time approximation scheme